righty. So let's bring up our next speaker, who is uh, Dick Luthi from Stanford University, where he's the Silas H. Palmer Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, very relevant to his talk today is he is also the director of the National Science Foundation Engineering Research Center entitled Reinventing the Nation's Urban Water Infrastructure, or uh, Renew It. Uh, so Dick is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and uh, a great guy. And so he's going to tell us all about that stormwater stuff. I'm going to tell please. you about stormwater, but first, uh, George, I have to say, I think my grandsons would applaud you because the answer to the future is more computer games. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what I'd like to talk about today is uh, stormwater capture, treatment, and recharge, uh, and the idea of using stormwater as part of our urban water supply. And uh, you'll see some other names at the bottom of the slide. These are colleagues of mine that work in our NSF Engineering Research Center for reinventing the nation's urban water infrastructure. So the presentation today has uh, three parts to it. One is to look at uh, what, what um, might we achieve with urban stormwater capture? What's the opportunity for us here in California to have stormwater be a, a part of our urban water supply? Uh, and then secondly, um, we're, we're talking about uh, not hillside runoff, but runoff from urban hardscape. So questions come up about, well, we need some uh, treatment of this stormwater. Uh, what would be the right kinds of treatment? And uh, we need to be able to demonstrate things at scale. And then the last part is, uh, should we be thinking about our uh, stormwater systems and our water reuse systems as separate? Or could we think about marrying the two? And that's where the um, discussion will come about decision support tools and how we might actually do that. So one slide about uh, the state of affairs in California with respect to stormwater. We, we've managed stormwater for flood control. And uh, in this part of the country, meaning LA and Orange County, uh, there were catastrophic floods in 1938. And, uh, and after that, uh, the stream channels were widened and hardened, and we have these concrete rivers that you see. And that does a good job of taking stormwater to the coast. But along with that water that goes to the ocean, we also carry pollutants to the beaches. And we have this other problem then about polluted beaches. So you can read this um, headline from uh, the New York Times here a couple of years ago, slaking a region's thirst while cleaning its beaches. If we could do more in terms of stormwater management and capture and use, that could help augment the urban water supply. And at the same time, it would provide other community benefits like cleaning the beaches. So here's the way we think about uh, stormwater in the sense that um, just as you could reuse uh, wastewater, so could we um, think about urban runoff. And the urban runoff could become part of our water supply uh, for non-potable or possibly potable water use. Uh, and also it could be used to um, recharge our um, aquifers and then from there find its way back into our water supply system. So the idea then is just like with wastewater, here you think about stormwater sort of closing the loop here. Um, Governor Brown has been a champion for uh, things related to water in the last couple years, and just last year at this time, just a year ago, Governor Brown had a proclamation on uh, stormwater capture bill. And in this bill, if you read the language, it says that within the Bay Area and uh, uh, Southern California, uh, there is the opportunity to capture more than 600,000 acre feet of stormwater and put that to, to good use. So what might this look like um, if we actually started thinking about uh, stormwater use? And this is a pie chart um, that's been put together by Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Um, the pie chart's a couple of years old, but it shows the situation as of today where half the water for Los Angeles is imported. Now the plan for the future under Mayor Villagrosa was to reduce dependency on imported water by half, even in the face of population growth in, uh, in Los Angeles, to reduce the demand for imported water by half. And that gives greater reliability, greater water security. And how is that achieved? Well, you can see some of the solutions there, but one of them is stormwater capture. And on this drawing, it says that stormwater would be 4% of the urban water supply. In a moment, I'll show you that it really could be much more than that. It could be three, four, maybe even five times that if, uh, if plans come, come, come into being in uh, this century. 
Well, this was, uh, this was the plan about seven, eight years ago, uh, but Mayor Garcetti, in response to the drought, said, you know, this 20-year this horizon is too far off. We need to move up to that by, by 10 years. So this is the goal in, uh, uh, for 2025 now. In other words, it's not that far away. Now, Los Angeles, like other cities, has been looking at stormwater management, and Los Angeles has prepared a uh, stormwater capture master plan. And this is a slide I got from Rafael Villegas, who works with the uh, LA Department of Water and Power. Now, this is a very interesting slide, uh, one we should pause on, just like George Simonoglis had you pause on a couple of slides. Uh, here it shows um, the present state with regard to capturing storm water in the spreading basins. These are the spreading basins that are located a little bit in then near the base of the foothills, and that's there in uh, blue. That's existing spreading. Uh, the, the green is the incidental recharge. And so on, on, on the left, you see that with today's systems, we're capturing about um, 100,000 acre feet. Now, what might the future be? And there are different scenarios here. There's a conservative future, and there's an aggressive future, and there are futures in between. But the point is, is that with a conservative future, the amount of stormwater we capture could actually double. It could go to 200,000 acre feet, and if we're aggressive, and that means if we have the political will and the financing and the like, uh, that number could become uh, 300,000 acre feet or close to it. Now this is for the city of Los Angeles. And I remember the slide a minute ago, I said, what's the water demand for the city? Well, in the future, maybe 700,000 acre feet a year. So the opportunity here um, is for stormwater to do much more than 4%. They could be as much as maybe 20% or, or a quarter, something like that. So this is an important, uh, for me anyway, a motivational slide about what's the opportunity there for us. Now, when we think about stormwater capture, we're in a Mediterranean climate. And in a Mediterranean climate, as you know, it rains in the winter and we actually need the water right now, today. A full, uh, you know, about eight months since it's rained, if, if we have rain. And so the question is, what kind of system might, might we envision? Well, we, we need a big rain barrel, is what we need. Uh, and uh, if you think about putting water in a tank, now this is the uh, stormwater capture tank in the Hollywood Hills put together by an environmental group. And you can see this is a major construction here. This is, a, this is for 200,000 gallons of water. And you see, wow, that is a, that's a big enterprise. You have structural walls and floors and a parking lot with, a, with the roof over it and all that. Um, so storage is a challenge with seasonal rainfall patterns. So when we looked at that previous slide by Rafael Villegas, there are two parts there. There's the centralized part, and that's the big part, and there's another part for decentralized. There are all good reasons to do de decentralized stormwater capture. The reasons are here with the Tree People's Headquarters, um, it's, uh, it's aspirational. Uh, you give tour groups there on sustainable living and sustainable practice and the like, and it's good to do it. Also, within a city, it takes stormwater capture into neighborhoods, and that's very important too, so that uh, uh, a neighborhood could see an example of, of beneficial capture of uh, stormwater. But to make a difference, we'll need to have um, a, a big difference. We're gonna have to have larger systems. And here's what we're thinking of uh, at uh, Renew It, is stormwater capture treatment and recharge. And so this is the schematic that shows how this might work. Um, you have stormwater that goes into a, uh, a capture basin, and that capture basin uh, would uh, rise and fall with the, with the uh, level of the, of the stormwater, but it allows you with that capture basin to settle solids and to have some photolysis occur. And then in a metered way, in a controlled way, it can go through uh, filtering operations that, that, are, that are passive, um, that make contain uh, sand and iron mixture for in a trickling filter mode for removal of phosphorus and heavy metals, and then uh, uh, biofilter for removal of nitrate, and then some geomedia like oxides of manganese and biochar for a final polishing step. So one of our hypotheses is, is that um, a, a system like this where you have a little sequence of filters is uh, each will perform better than, than one separately. And then we also think that it is a system like this that will remove the contaminants from the urban hardscape. 
So what is it, what, what might a system actually look like? Well, um, this is a system that's being planned for Los Angeles in the Sun Valley neighborhood just north of the Burbank Airport. And I'm showing you the artist's sketch here of a stormwater capture treatment and recharge system. And it doesn't look like an engineer schematic, it looks like a park. And that's a great public feature. And the neighborhood is one that really doesn't have such, uh, such urban amenities. And what's being done here is a former sand and gravel quarry was bought by the city and the flood control district. And that 45 acre site's being converted into stormwater capture um, recharge system. And along the way, you create hiking paths and basketball courts and play fields and that sort of thing. Um, well, this system now, it's, uh, it's 900 acre feet a year, so we're talking about a large volume of water here. Uh, this is referred to as the Rory M. Shaw Wetlands Park. And so that's what a capture treatment recharge system could look like. A little more of a schematic here is shown where you see the detention basin, uh, the wetlands, and the water would flow through the wetlands to the lower, um, lower right corner. And then from there, we would say, well, we put in some additional filters here, and then we pump that over to a groundwater recharge facility. Well, these artist sketches are great, but they don't really tell the whole story. Um, and the area that's drained here is shown in this bottom picture. It's a lot of automobile salvage yards and, uh, and industrial activities like uh, cement plants and that kind of thing. So, so the water that's coming into that basin is really heavily, well, it, it, it just drains all these salvage yards and the like. It's what I would call the water off the urban hardscape. And so we know there are contaminants there and, we, they, and they've been measured. So when we think about urban stormwater now, now to transition to the treatment stuff, um, we have these contaminants, the pathogens, we have the urban use biocides, and I show you two there, diuron and fripanil, and then also the vehicle related compounds, uh, oils and that kind of thing you would suspect. But I call your attention to um, benzotriazole and, mercap and um, mercaptobenzothiazole. What are those compounds? Well, mercaptobenzothiazole uh, comprises about maybe four or five percent of the weight of automobile tires. Um, and uh, benzyl triazole is used as an anti-corrosive agent that you find in stormwaters. So these suite of compounds here are not the ones you find in wastewater treatment. They're, I would say they're unique to uh, stormwater. So we need to have treatment systems that can deal with the metals and deal with these kind of organics and also with, uh, with uh, nutrients as well. So here's a picture of the standard design. Uh, as becomes as referred to as a best management practice, um, and what there is is about a foot and a half of uh, spec soil with with some gravel at, at the bottom. Well, the thing about these systems is is that um, they give inconsistent performance, and 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 they're not designed to a certain water quality. They're designed to a specification. You can see the specification there. Well, how do you think that will work with something like benzotriazole that's very soluble? I don't think it's going to work at all. And in fact, these systems, if you go to the best management practice database, as Ali Bain has done, and, um, and looked at how well these systems work, there's a lot of inconsistency. And uh, these are data from her, looking at um, uh, a lot of data from different systems, and looking at three examples here, going from uh, left to right. In the left, there's removal of pathogens. In the middle, there's no removal. And then in the third, well, there's actually some generation of pathogens for some reason. So this is, this is not a very good state of affairs. And this brings us now to um, our work in which we imagine that we could design some filters that comprise different sorts of geomedia, like biochar or iron filings, and see how well they work for removal of pathogens, nutrients, and trace organics. So for um, the biochar, um, this sketch here shows um, the removal of uh, E. coli uh, through a type of biochar referred to as Sonoma biochar, and that's the data right there at the bottom where I drew the red circle around it. And, uh, and this performs quite well, more than two log removal of, of E. coli in our laboratory tests. Uh, it also works in the presence of natural organic matter and it works best with the wet and dry cycles, the kind of things that you would expect to see in a stormwater capture system. So uh, the biochar can help a lot with pathogen removal. Now we gotta try this out in the field, but these results are very encouraging. With regard to uh, nitrate, 
We've been studying um, uh, wood chip biofilters. Uh, the idea here is that uh, you pass water through a, a bed of wood chips, uh, oxygen is depleted, and fungus in the reactor will slowly um, uh, eat away at the wood chips, give a little bit of cellulosic material, not a, very much, a few milligrams maybe, and then uh, that's used by the uh, denitrifying microorganisms to reduce nitrate. Um, and you can see examples here of, of a schematic of what we're studying in the lab. And the way this works then, uh, some data here where you see uh, two different flow rates, one centimeter and two centimeters an hour. Uh, nitrate removal, uh, uh, in one case 10 milligrams per liter easily or maybe uh, five milligrams at the higher flow rate. Um, also you see the removal of dissolved oxygen and the increase of dissolved organic carbon from the wood. So our, um, our challenge in the lab with my student Brian Halliburka is he has a lots of this kind of data and then put these three phenomena together because they're all related here. Um, how do you put that together in an integrated model to be able to, to predict the performance of one of these wood chip reactors? Uh, we, our reactors in the lab have been operating now for oh, well over a year and a half and these wood chips will last a um, number of years once they're set up. Well, what about the following, you know, the very last step here with maybe some trace organics and uh, Joe Charbonnet at Berkeley with Dave Sedlak has been studying manganese oxides. And this, is, uh, this shows the results with uh, uh, bisphenol A and the removal, at, uh, depending on different pH and what the uh, background electrolyte is. But the story is, is that if you imagine maybe 50 centimeters of uh, sand-coated manganese oxide, and if you've gone through these pretreatment steps, you may have just a little bit of oxidizable organic matter left, uh, maybe, maybe 50 micrograms per liter, or a couple hundred micrograms per liter, and uh, and the estimate is is that would have a life for a number of years. Joe believes it would last that long. I think it might be something less, but the point is is that um, you won't have to change these media very often, and you would do maintenance on them anyway, maybe on a five-year cycle or something. So how would these systems then all be put together? Well, the schematic again, uh, showing this capture, treatment, and recharge system uh, here with a settling pond, then trickling water over the sand filings and, uh, I mean sand and iron filings mixture for the phosphorus and metals removal, then upflow through the uh, uh, wood chip reactor uh, for nitrate removal, and then through the biochar manganese system for the polishing, and then and then into the groundwater. And so we're recharging groundwater here. Um, you'll notice it says automated control up there. And the idea then is is to work with um, colleagues, our friends at OptiRTC that used to be with Geosyntec, and do some automated control here so we can use weather forecasting to help anticipate when storms may come and what rate we may have to put water through 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 these filters. So that's what we've been doing in the lab, and now we are um, moving into the field. These are um, test columns that we've set up at, uh, with Sonoma County Water Agency. Our stormwater work is being supported in large part by uh, uh, Sonoma County Water Agency, LA Department of Water, Bureau of Sanitation, and the Flood Control District. But you can see here the columns we have for the nitrate test columns, with columns in triplicate, with wood chips alone and with biochar and with straw. That's different kinds of organic matter. And the geomedia columns with mixtures of manganese oxide in the biochar. And so uh, we've set this up at Sonoma, and we'll be setting up a system like this down in LA. Uh, I should say up in LA. I realize where I, I think it's that way. <laughs> yeah, up, up in LA, we'll be setting up a system um, right, right adjacent to that um, Roy, the future Roy M. Shaw uh, wetlands. All right, the last subject was um, how might we couple recycled water and storm water? What's the opportunities there? Um, so this is a, a schematic um, that shows the, uh, how, how this might work. And on the, on the far left here, you see advanced uh, water purification facility of the kind that we've already heard about, making high quality water that then could be put into a spreading basin. Uh, and then from a spreading basin that would percolate in the ground and then it gets pumped out as part of the water supply. And this, in fact, is, um, is being done uh, from the 
uh, Donald C. Tillman Water Reclamation Plant and putting water over to the uh, Hanson Spreading Grounds. And the plan is to expand that uh, to the Pacoima Spreading Grounds and then also maybe bring some other water over there as well. But the advantage of this is, is that we already have the infrastructure in place for the spreading grounds. We already have the infrastructure in place for pumping that water out of the ground and having it become part of, the, of our city's water supply. So there's a great opportunity here to try to marry these two systems, the water reuse and the, uh, and the stormwater recharge systems. This is a picture of the uh, Pacoima spreading grounds. Uh, this is what they look like um, most of the year. They're not doing a lot. Um, and you could imagine that this would be a place where I could pump recycled water and it could percolate into the ground and now it becomes part of the um, uh, urban water supply. So that's our thinking here. We'd like to understand how this might actually really work. And that requires we have some decision support tools. Now, a proposal that's just been made by the Metropolitan Water District is shown here. Now this is September uh, 2015. It's just a month ago from now. Uh, titled their Water Planning Stewardship Committee Report. And, the, and what they're looking at is uh, taking water from this coastal plant, that's the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant, and then pumping it inland uh, to, to different spreading grounds. Now, um, those of you who live down here, you know these distances are quite large. Maybe um, to Rio Hondo, it might be uh, 15 miles up there near the Santa Fe. It's closer to 30 miles. Uh, Rio Hondo is 150 feet uphill. Uh, Santa Fe is 500 feet uphill. So is, is this the best way? Uh, now, the Metropolitan Water District uh, likes this because they have the, the land down there at the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant. That's where that water is made. They could put in one of these advanced purification facilities. But the challenge is then you're pumping that water up uh, back uphill and you have to do all the trenching and piping for that. So my student, John Bradshaw, has been looking at how we might think about the system-wide optimization. And showing, showing here in blue are spreading basins and the size of the blue dots are an estimate of the excess capacity there. And showing in um, red here are places where you could get recycled water. The big one there on the coast, that's in LA, that's the Hyperion plant. I don't show the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant here. But the, there's one plant right there in the city, uh, or in the center, that red circle with the X. Um, that's a proposed metro plant. Uh, and the Bureau of Sanitation has been thinking about a satellite treatment plant um, for uh, uh, capturing water for, for reuse. It wouldn't have to be a full wastewater treatment plant, a satellite plant. And so what uh, John's been thinking about then is, well, with these different options, how, how might this really work? What's the best arrangement? And so I, I show you here um, in the upper left is the Hansen Spreading Grounds, um, and then uh, down there at the bottom are the uh, Hyperion, uh, and then another example of that n possible new metro plant, what it would take to get water over to uh, the Rio Hondo Spreading Grounds. From the um, Hyperion, it's about 20 miles and 200 feet uphill. From, uh, from a possible metro satellite plant, it's 10 miles, uh, but it's downhill. It's downhill 50 feet. Well, which is better here? How, how would you cost this out and the like? Well, fortunately, um, we can look at this uh, system that was put in uh, to take water from uh, the Tillman plant over to the Hanson Spreading Grounds, and that gives us very, very current information about uh, construction costs, trenching costs, piping costs and that kind of thing. And John's been working on that. And our goal here is first, let's sort of figure out the different kinds of arrangements that might work here and then think about the rest of the county. So this is an example of his work then where you look at the Tillman uh, Reclamation Plant to the Hanson Spreading Grounds. And now this is, uh, George, we call this full advanced treatment, I think, is the phrase. Um, well, the conveyance there is 10 miles and 200 feet. And the, the purple uh, is the uh, cost for the uh, uh, conveyance, and the, uh, the light pinkish is the cost of the treatment. And so what are, the, what are the costs here for this water? Well, it might be $750 an acre foot. Met water costs a lot more than that. 
Now, it might be that in these spreading grounds, you wouldn't be putting water in them for maybe a couple of months during the year, during the wet time in the winter. If we anticipate an El Nino event, maybe you don't put water there for three months. And so John's thought about that and how does that affect the cost. It doesn't, it doesn't affect the cost very much if the plants were idle for, uh, for a couple of months. But the, the, what, it, what is interesting here is to think, you know, think back at that uh, diagram for the Metropolitan Water District and pumping uh, not 10 miles, but maybe 20 miles or maybe 30 miles and going, um, and going large distances up, uphill. And what will happen then is that um, that purple part is going to become a bigger and more important part of, this, uh, of the cost. So how all this would fit together then? Well, this is, uh, I think, this is a very rich problem. It's complex. There isn't a, a, a straightforward answer here, and, and that's, that's what we're studying. So my, my take-home messages here then were, um, were three. Uh, one, that the urban uh, stormwater can make a really significant difference and contribute to our water supplies. And I hope I was able to show you by examples there at the Roy M. Shaw Wetlands that if we do it right, it can contribute to urban amenities as well. But also, when we look at the types of contaminants we have from the urban hardscape, um, well, we need to have um, design experience with how these treatment systems might work so that um, we can be sure that when we put that water in the ground, we're not causing a groundwater contamination problem. And then lastly, we need these decision support tools so we can understand how these stormwater recharge systems might work with other components of our urban water infrastructure. And with that, I'll, I'll stop, and I thank you for your attention. All right, we have time for a few questions for Dick, so let's see who might have one. Oh, right here, Jeff, right in front. Uh, thanks, Dick, and um, I appreciate all the work you guys are doing with LA. I know LA is very interested in trying to optimize uh, uh, stormwater capture. So you didn't, I know you didn't spend a lot of time on the basin per se, but uh, it's such an asset for them. Um, and I, th I think that's really part of the conversation is the value of that basin, be able to have a place where you can store that water and to be able to store it in a way you can get it back out. Is that correct? Yes. So uh, what, what uh, Jeff is asking about, uh, I, I said this is a three-part system, capture, treat, recharge. You need to have a place where you can put that water, and the best place to recharge is, uh, as I think about it, it's uh, inland and north of downtown LA. Uh, when you, if you're in downtown LA and you look, look towards the ocean, towards Santa Monica, a lot of that land is too clay. It's, just, it's not very permeable. Now for LA, they like the San Fernando Valley because they have Pueblo water rights there. Uh, if you go to some other basins, there's shared water rights, and these things can be worked out, but for them, there's a preference for the, San, for the San Fernando Valley because any water they put in, they think is theirs. There are challenges, though, with how this would work because there's groundwater contamination in the San Fernando Valley, so there has to be some cleanup that goes along with this. Or, But right there in the case of the Sun Valley area, it's, it's, we don't have quite the same plumes there. But how this, you, you need the right kind of geology and the subsurface needs to be such that you're not exacerbating a, a groundwater contamination problem. Okay, Dr. Schnoor has a question. Very nice talk, Dick, thank you so much. Uh, my question is, we, we talked earlier this morning about that, uh, the tendency w with climate change and uh, the need for water that rivers no longer flow to the sea. Yet water sustainability we usually define as being the water required for people and for uh, aquatic biota. How do we factor in the fact that, uh, I, I like this idea of uh, using the um, urban stormwater, but how do we factor in the fact that the estuaries no longer get any fresh water? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, where would that water come from? Well, eventually that water would find its way back into the estuary, but uh, it wouldn't be in a surge. Um, so there are some dynamics there. Um, I, I think a different problem or a different question is what's special about the big cities in California? And why can I stand up here and say, let's capture stormwater? Well, that's because uh, there are no water rights issues. 
Now, I realize that's not the same thing as ecosystem services and water for ecosystem, but a problem in inland areas is that, uh, that there's someone else that has a claimant to that stormwater. But here on the coast, it's just a lost resource. I, I think, too, Jerry, it's a question of uh, it, that water that goes in the estuary. Let's look at Santa Monica Bay. Uh, you have a lot of pollutants going down to Santa Monica Bay. So we, we aren't maybe doing the public health service or we're not doing the ecosystem services with the way the systems are today. So this can, this can help, uh, maybe can help address that too. Nick, uh, another question. This is Mike Wayne, Orange County oh, Water District. Um, you give us unit costs on the recycled water. Do you also have unit costs on the stormwater capture and cleanup systems, what you think that would be per, per acre foot? Oh, yes. It's, uh, it really depends on the, on the size of the system. If you are uh, a, a small neighborhood scale, which are great for demonstration and community engagement, uh, those, those are quite high. I mean, it's thousands of dollars or more per acre foot. Uh, here, we're a lot lower, less than $1,000 an acre foot. Actually, um, Rich Atwater in the S Southern California Water Committee has reports about this where they've looked at what these might cost depending on system size. The cost really, be, it, the systems really become attractive when you get above about 500 acre feet a year. The other thing with that is when you have a system that size, you can afford to have people watch over it and that sort of thing as well. But when you go to smaller systems, the costs just go up and up. Uh, but there, there is, there's a place for those, as I mentioned earlier, because it takes such systems in, in, into the neighborhoods. There's a public education piece there, and it uh, s helps sustain community engagement. Great. Okay, with that, I think we need to close this session. So let's thank Dick. Thank you.